Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Naveen Baswani, online producer with The Agenda. Welcome again to uh, one of our live chats as uh, all eyes remain on the province in light of Dalton McGinty's resignation and the prorogation of Parliament. And with us now is Steve Pakin. Say hi, Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. I, I'm sorry, Naveen. I'm still new at this, and I expected to see myself in the picture here, but I don't see myself. Are you seeing yourself now? I am when you're, not. You're speaking? Well, I, I'm seeing you, so uh, I think everything is on track um, in terms of uh, the technical arrangement. If anyone's having any issues, uh, we do have a, a little bit of a new uh, a layout on the, on the page on our website, so you'll now see the YouTube video and the chat console side by side. So we're trying to uh, make the experience a little bit better for you. If you are having any issues, please uh, refresh the page. That's the best... Uh, that's the best solution usually for these types of issues. You want but me to do that too? I know. I think you're good, Steve. So <laughs> I, I'm seeing you when you're uh, you're popping up on my screen. So I think we're good. Okay. Um, just uh, kicking off this live chat, we've got you for about half an hour here. Uh, we do have a live show at eight o'clock, and I just want to know what's the what's the reaction that you've heard over the last twenty four hours? It's obviously one of the biggest stories. Well, this would be the biggest kind of departure from Queen's Park story, I would guess, in about 27 years. I think you've got to go back to 1980, what was it, Thanksgiving weekend 1984 to find something comparable where everybody assumed that the premier of the day was showing up to make one announcement and, in fact, made quite a different one. In that case, it was Bill Davis showing up after Thanksgiving weekend in what everybody thought was a certain election call, and, in fact, he announced his retirement from public life. And this one, I think, similarly caught people off guard. Um, I, got, I gather that very few people knew that Dalton McGinty was going to resign. And uh, not only that, uh, the people who did know managed to keep that secret very tight to the vest, and it did not get out. Um, many of these resignation stories do manage to seep out ahead of time and take some of the thunder away. But yesterday's announcement shocked everybody. It was, of course, a, a last-minute caucus meeting at which Mr. McGinty went in, uh, got lots of applause, stood in front of his caucus mates, uh, thanked them, told them about, the, uh, as they perceived it, the, their achievements over the years, announced he was proroguing the House. I think at that point most people thought, okay, that's pretty big news. Uh, but then he said, it's time to refresh and renew the party, and that was the big surprise. I, I, I've heard two kinds of reactions today. The first is, uh, the guy was a pretty amazing politician. He's the first liberal uh, premier in 126 years to win three elections in a row. That's been hard for liberals to do in the province, so um, you have to give the man his due on that. He's been underestimated since the get-go, and those who have done so have generally uh, looked uh, ahead of them as he has managed to lap them or cross the finish line ahead of them. The other thing, though, that I'm also hearing is that uh, there's no question his legacy will suffer some tarnish um, in light of the events of the last few days, and that is the proroguing of the legislature, the shutting down of question period, the shutting down, more importantly, of committees, and in particular, the committee that is going to consider the contempt allegation against his energy minister. Um, the liberal brand is not in great shape right now, as we know, in Ontario, and I guess some people are quite convinced that uh, the premier didn't do any favors to that brand by doing what he did. So that's the, if I can put it, the, sort of the two-track analysis that I'm getting back at this early stage. Great. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do have a few questions that are coming into the live chat, and Freddie, a uh, user Freddie has the first one, and he asks, why would any group negotiate with McGinty now that he is no longer going to be around? Well, let's keep in mind he's around until his successor is picked, and we don't know when his successor will be picked. The Liberal Executive Council uh, was, was to have met today to begin its deliberations on when the convention would be, what kind of a leadership convention it would be, would it be delegated, one person, one vote? Uh, where would it be? Uh, how much money can you raise? There are lots of questions around all of this. Uh, keeping in mind there's a federal liberal convention as well coming up in uh, April, and presumably the Ontario liberals want to have their leadership convention before that one. So uh, McGinty is around until that next premier is picked, uh, so that should be all the incentive you need if you want to get business done to have to continue to work with them. Okay, great. And... Um... One of the other questions um, in terms of reaction today, has any further light been shed on why he stepped down, or is it are we still in uh, speculation mode, if I can say so? Well, I talked to one of his quite close friends today, and I won't name the person because obviously what he was telling me was based on 
uh, personal interaction and private conversation. But essentially, what the fellow told me was, he's had enough. And you can understand that. Uh, he's been in public life for 22 years, Mr. McGinty has. He's been Liberal leader since 1996, so that's 16 years. He's been Premier for nine. It's arguably the second or third hardest job in politics in the whole country, uh, assuming Prime Minister is number one, possibly Premier of Quebec being number two, but it, it's, it's number two or 2A, either way you look at it. And he'd won three elections, he'd contested four elections. His explanation was that he went to his daughter Carlene's wedding recently and surrounded by friends and family, it sort of hit home to him how much he had missed over the years by being in public life. And furthermore, the um, endorsement he got at the last uh, provincial annual general meeting of the Liberal Party, in which he got an 86% support, uh, which is a pretty good number, was higher than Tim Hudak's number and higher than Andrea Horvath's number at their respective conventions. So he said to himself, um, I'd rather go out when people want me to stay as opposed to when they want to kick me out the door. And I think we just have to kind of accept the fact that um, after having been in it this long, he's probably had enough. He doesn't want to run again. And if you don't want to run in another election, then you should step down. And so he has. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm receiving, I've received a couple of comments uh, from a couple of users asking if the video portion of the chat is live, and indeed it is. So if you're having any issues, please uh, first make sure you press play on the YouTube video, and if that's still not working, uh, just please refresh your browser. And uh, William, one of the users, William, did let me know that it is working. So um, I hope uh, everyone's uh, able to access the video. And uh, here's a question from Steve. Uh, or here's a question for you, Steve, from Debbie. There has been some speculation that, um, sorry, I just had a, a little pop up. But there has been some speculation that McGinty will run federally to provide Justin Trudeau with a serious challenger, so that Trudeau is not crowned. Has there been any known example of this type of challenge in the past? And if so, was it successful? Well, Mr. McGinty's got a couple of things going against him already on that front. Number one. If you think back on all of the previous premiers of Ontario who have become prime minister, let me think, let me think, the list is empty. Uh, the premier knows this. Uh, why he said last night at his farewell news conference, uh, I'm, I have no plans to run for any further position in politics, uh, really quite astonished me because that's the kind of thing you say when you want to keep the door open. And I would have thought that on his retirement from Ontario politics announcement, he'd want to shut that door pretty tight. After all, one of the reasons we're told that he's leaving public life right now is that he wants to spend more time with his family. And it would be an unusual move, to say the least, for him to say, I need to spend more time with my family, but I'm about to undertake a 10-year project to try to bring the federal liberals back from third place to first place. Uh, he's 57 years old. He's still got his health. Uh, he has some good earning years ahead of him if he wants them. Uh, I don't know what he'll do next. He says he, ha he does, has no uh, plans uh, firmed up yet. And I think we have to take him at his word in that in the absence of any other evidence. Of his own accord, so successfully, to run for what is arguably a very, very difficult job right now, namely bringing the federal liberals back, the only reason I can think of as to why he didn't shut the door completely on this is the following. I believe the liberals federally have until the 14th of January in which to run for the national leadership. In other words, the cutoff to get into the race is Jan 14. It may well be that Mr. McGinney is saying to himself, if over the next, where are we here, middle of October, November, December, if over the next three months, Justin Trudeau somehow puts his foot in it and flames out um, and somehow becomes um, a damaged candidate, uh, then you'd have to admit that the likely number two choice for liberals across the country would in fact be Dalton McGuinty. He's the most successful liberal politician in the country today. And so he may be keeping that door open just a smidge for that reason. But I think the odds are very, very tall that that would ever happen. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we're going we're gonna to keep moving uh, fast and furious here. Uh, JD asks, how will McGuinty's res resignation affect Bill 115 and teachers? Well, Bill 115 is a done deal. Uh, I don't think McGinty's resignation has an effect on that. What will have an effect on that is what the courts say. Uh, it's going before the lower courts right now. I imagine the uh, unions that are opposing it will take it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. So the Premier's resignation, I don't think, has an impact on that. Uh, the court system may very well. Stay tuned on that one. 
Great. Can you give us a sense uh, quickly? I know we're going to be having um, opposition. We're going to be having the opposition leaders on tonight, uh, both Tim Hudak and Andrea Horwath. Can you give us a, a little teaser of what they might be saying tonight? Uh, sure. Uh, I have no doubt but that they will say that uh, McGinty deserves credit for his electoral record. After all, um, he defeated Andrea Horvath, he defeated Tim Hudak in the last Ontario election. And I, you know, these are the kinds of things you say uh, in order to praise somebody who you think is completely off base. So I have no doubt they'll say uh, he's been a good leader in terms of winning elections. He's a, he's a pretty savvy politician. I have a feeling, though, they're also both going to say, um, you know, Mr. Mr. McGinty's vision for Ontario was the wrong one. He's left us deeper in debt. He's messed up the power plant issues in Oakville and Mississauga pretty badly. Orange happened on his watch. E-Health happened on his watch. And now he's proroguing the legislature to prevent any further examination of this. Uh, so uh, some praise, but mostly uh, unhappiness and criticism over the way he's going out. Thanks, Steve. And just a reminder... You still have to watch at 8 o'clock to be sure that that's what they're going to say, Naveen. That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, tune in at 8 and 11 p.m. tonight for a uh, reaction. Uh, the next question I've got, it's actually, it's from Mary C. Kelly, and she's given a, a long comment before it, but the main question that I'm going to read to you, Steve, is when um, the legislature does resume, when, when action picks up again at Queen's Park, could the the Ontario Progressive Conservatives and the Ontario NDP reintroduce their contempt motion and include Dalton McGuinty in it? Well, I guess the answer is yes. I'm not sure what the point of including Dalton McGuinty in it would be at this point, given that he will have left. Although he still, while he won't be the Premier, he has said he will stay on as the MPP for Ottawa South. So I guess technically he'd still be in the legislature, although I'd be very surprised if he ever showed up for question period or any of the debates. That's not something that leaders who step down usually do. But yes, once the, le once the legislature is, come, uh, is called back, uh, technically all of those bills that have now died because of the prorogation, technically they can all be introduced again. I think the question that has to be asked right now is when the Liberals pick their new leader, uh, it's an open question as to whether or not the new leader will want to meet the House. Uh, two potential arguments here, Naveen. Number one, or Mary, I guess I should say. Number one, um, if the Liberals get a bit of a bump from picking a new leader, he or she may want to go to the polls right away uh, and not take the chance of bringing the House back. After all, bringing the House back is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you get to demonstrate that you are premierial. On the other hand, you are now all of a sudden, in, particularly in question period, in the eye of the storm, and a lot of arrows are going to be aimed at you. So I'm not so sure it's a slam dunk that the House is actually going to be called back when the new leader is picked. Uh, we'll see. Thanks, Steve. Peter asks a question uh, along the same lines in regards to the contempt motion. Do you think Dalton McGinty resigned in order to protect Minister Bentley? I don't know that he resigned in order to protect Minister Bentley. No, I don't believe that's the case. But I, it, it seems pretty irrefutable to me that he prorogued the House in order to protect Minister Bentley. Uh, again, two seconds of background here for those who don't know. Chris Bentley is the energy minister. Uh, while, while none of the malfeasance around these plants happened on his watch, decisions were made by previous energy ministers or, or before Chris Bentley got the file to move these uh, power plants from Oakville and Mississauga to other places. Uh, the fact is he has the portfolio now, and the fact is he had, he had the portfolio when the request for documents about these cancellations was made by the opposition, and he chose, apparently, although he may have been told by the Premier's office, who knows, but he was the guy in the catbird seat uh, when the request for documents came forward and he declined to fulfill that request. The Speaker eventually made a ruling forcing him to do so. He did so. And then a couple of weeks later, after a second search uh, by his officials in the civil service, I add, um, it, it apparently emerged that there were 20,000 more documents he didn't know about. Uh, so he's the focus of the contempt motion. Does Dalton McGinty like Chris Bentley? Yes, he does. Would he try to do everything he could to protect Chris Bentley from being, in his view, unfairly targeted by this contempt process? Yes, he would. And I suspect that's what is at the center of the prorogation. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, before I get to the next question from Chris, I just want to point out that uh, our producer, Hillary Clark, wrote a blog post earlier this afternoon um, detailing, it. Actually, it's actually a list of 39 bills that made it to second reading or later that are now dead. So make sure you check out our blog for, it's, it's a really good detailed list of all the bills that are affected by this prorogation. And I'm gonna to get to the next question now from Chris. 
Steve, it's a bit of a technical question. So if obstructing legislature is punishable by imprisonment, would not what McGinty did yesterday by proroguing the legislature the proroguing the legislature be tantamount to obstructing justice? Ah, uh, that's a fascinating question. Um, here's the reality. The reality is, and we saw this federally, remember, when Stephen Harper was sitting atop a minority government, the other opposition parties, which would have been the NDP, the Bloc, and the Liberals, all worked together to pass a contempt motion. Remember, the, 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 the government didn't fall on a budget bill. It fell on contempt, if I remember properly. And the, the uh, Harper government's position is, look, you opposition people are the majority in this house, so you can do anything you want. You can pass contempt motions even if what we've done isn't truly contemptuous. I leave it for our viewers to decide whether it was or wasn't. And the same thing is true right now. The NDP and the, and the conservatives have the majority of the members in this house, which means that if they, in their wisdom, decide that somebody is acting in contempt of the legislature, they can so vote. And the liberals... Um, can do nothing about it. Now it may well be that Chris Bentley's activities were on the merits by neutral third party observers found to be contemptuous. I don't know. Uh, but at the moment the only people who seem to think that he's being contemptuous are the opposition politicians. So if they decide it's contempt, they're in the majority. It's contempt. Okay, uh, t Tom has sent in a question that, that feeds, into the, feeds into your answer here. He, he, uh, he writes, uh, given that proroguing the government is not actually all that atypical, is the, opposition being, is the opposition response too harsh? Are they setting the bar too high in that they might want to use this tactic as well? Well, that's a good point. And once upon a time, I mean, you're, you're right, prorogation is not extraordinary. It does happen a lot. Oftentimes in the past, though, it was only used as a tool. I shouldn't say only. It was mostly used as a tool by governments if they were in a bit of a rut or a bit of a slump or they wanted to kind of reboot or recharge or put a new face on um, policy. So they would prorogue the legislature, the legislature would break for three months or so, and then they would come back with a speech from the throne outlining sort of a new vision for where the government wanted to go forward. That is pretty clearly not the case here, and it pretty clearly wasn't the case federally either. I mean, Stephen Harper prorogued to avoid a date with the noose. That's pretty irrefutable. Dalton McGinty has prorogued so that his energy minister can't be the subject of contempt hearings. Those contempt hearings are now dead in the water for now. So prorogation seems to have taken on a new method, which is we're not just going to do it to put a fresh coat of paint on our government. We're going to do it to avoid significant difficulties. And that is different. And people can judge whether they think it's a good thing or not. All right. We are also... Um active on Twitter tonight. We're going to be, just a, just a note on uh, online programming, we are going to be continuing this chat until 9 p.m., but once Steve uh, departs to host the show, uh, we'll make this a text-only chat. So be sure to stay with us throughout uh, until 9 p.m., both here and on Twitter. And speaking of Twitter, uh, producer Allison uh, Buckenterrell has sent me a question that we just received on Twitter. There's actually three questions, Steve, and I'm going to get you to, ask the la uh, I'm going to, get you to answer the last one. So the three questions are, was proroguing Dalton's only option? Is his prorogue of the provincial legislature legal? And why did he not assign an interim leader? So essentially, why no interim leader and why this route, if you wouldn't mind, Steve? Thank okay, you. Okay, sure. No, uh, you know, was it his only option? No, he could have uh, simply kept going as he wanted to keep going. He, he could easily have stepped down and not prorogued the legislature. But as we suggested, uh, proroguing has, from a liberal point of view, the added benefit of shutting down all inquiry into the power plants issue and taking it out of question period as well. Is it legal? Absolutely. Of course it's legal. The premier goes to the lieutenant governor, asks for a prorogation. The lieutenant governor never has in the uh, uh, in the past in Ontario history, to my knowledge, I don't think it's ever happened, refused the request of a first minister uh, for prorogation. Uh, and the last question is, could he have, uh, you know, stepped down, appointed a, another interim leader and then gone forward? He could have. Uh, the Liberals have done that, funnily enough, three times in the, I think, three times in the past with Robert Nixon alone. Uh, Robert Nixon in the 1970s uh, lost an election to John Robarts, decided to step down. Uh, strangely enough, um, they had a leadership convention at which nobody was very happy with any of the candidates, so they asked Nixon to run again, and he won his leadership back. But then two more times after that, after Stuart Smith retired, and then after David Peterson retired, uh, Robert Nixon was thrust into the interim role again. And usually it's... it's it, it's a job that goes to a guy who A, doesn't want the leadership permanently, and B, has enough respect across the party 
um, and enough experience, sort of like an eminence grise, uh, that it's a non-controversial appointment. My only thinking here would be that Dalton McGinty didn't see that kind of person on his back benches and therefore decided to hang on to the job until his replacement is appointed. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Tim chimes in. I know you offered your musings on this already, Steve, last night, but it's the question many of us are really eager to hear if there's more information on. What's the early rumors on who's most likely going to run for leadership? Well, actually, the rumors, I think, have moved forward a little bit yesterday versus today, so I, I hope I have a little more information for you today. Um, for what it's worth, I was on News Talk 1010 this morning with Michael Bryant, who is, of course, one of the people being rumored to run, and Bryant, when asked this morning by John Moore about this, gave a very good answer, which was anybody who is seriously thinking about running and admits to that today that they're running uh, probably doesn't deserve to have the job. Uh, you know, there, there are kind of formalities around all of this, and the formality at the moment is Dalton McGinty gets a few days to either bask in the glory or deal with the misery of his decision, and people who are considering this do so um, discreetly, let's put it that way. But I think there's no question that, that um, if I had to bet, I'd say Kathleen Wynne is going to get in. Uh, to, you know, Dwight Duncan has already said, we, we, we were um, speculating about him last night, he's already said he's not going to go in. Uh, Deb Matthews is considering it, no doubt. Eric Hoskins is considering it, no doubt. Brad Duguid is considering it, no doubt. For all of their being outside of politics right now, I'm sure George Smitherman, who's a former Deputy Premier, and Michael Bryant, who's a former Attorney General, are also considering it, no doubt. I'm sure Yasser Nakvi, who's the President of the party and not in Cabinet, um, is one of many on the back bench that are considering it. Um, and you also have to remember that, that you know, once once people start coming up to you and saying you really need to consider this, people who might not otherwise have considered it will consider it. And Charles Susan, Mississauga comes to mind. He's not a guy who's sort of high up on everybody's list, but he's a good, solid, capable minister. He's got a good base out in Peel region, and it wouldn't surprise me if he decided to get in because a lot of people will put pressure on him because he might be, quote unquote, the 905 candidate. You know, a lot of this comes down to geography, a lot of it comes down to ideology, a lot of it comes down to gender. Um, a lot of, you know, these are the kinds of the ethnicity, uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, all potential candidates will consider uh, moving forward. Um, I think I'm going to put another name out there. Jeez, I don't know if I should do this. Go ahead, Steve. What? I'm going I'm to hold this one close to my vest for now because I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody from the outside who you don't, who, who's not on anybody's lips right now, but who is who's a former politician, but who is thinking about coming back into public life, uh, may just kick the tires on this thing. And that's all I'm going to say right now. We'll have to do another one of these in the days ahead, Naveen, and I may have more for you then. That, that was cruel, Steve, but I, I like your style. <laughs> um, we, we've got a really good question uh, from Steve Applin, and then I've got one from Stephen Lee. I'm going to get to Steve Applin's first. Okay, we like Steve. He's from Ottawa. has been on our program many times talking about nuclear issues. Here he is. Do you buy the Premier's line that he had to prorogue because he wasn't getting any legislative cooperation with the opposition? I don't recall hearing the word prorogue from him prior to yesterday. Uh, the short answer is no, but that's the Premier's explanation and he's staying with it. And, you know, the reality of a minority parliament is it's always going to be difficult to get along. Uh, that's the nature of it. You've got 107 different people in there, all of whom probably think they'd be a better Premier than the guy who's got the job. Or on the other side of the house, you've got people thinking they'd be better opposition leaders than the, the two people who have those jobs today. Uh, there's a lot of ego in that house. There's a lot of testosterone, even among the women. And as a result, um, you know, things, things are tense and things are sticky from time to time. So no, he didn't have to prorogue. Um, you know, the alternative is, of course, just to sit down in a room together and hammer things out. But uh, here we are. All right, uh, I know you're with us for only a few more minutes, so we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Uh, like Steve said, we're going to do more of these. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Here's Stephen Lee. Conversely to Debbie's question, have you heard of any federal MPs thinking of dropping into the provincial race? It seems more promising than being in third place federally. Uh, it's a good question, and, I, and I, would, um, I would observe that that kind of question gets a ton of speculation every time this happens. Uh, and it goes both ways. Um, you know, if there are vacant federal leaderships, uh, oftentimes it's provincial members who kick the tires on that. And we saw the last time out, or a couple times ago, Gerard Kennedy, 
uh, left the Ontario legislature uh, to run federally and then eventually run for the federal liberal leadership. I think the trouble at the moment is um, I don't see anybody, there's 35 MPs in Ottawa right now, and I don't see any of them who have either expressed any interest or who feel a kind of a provincial orientation. They're up there in Ottawa because those are the issues that interest them. And uh, the other thing you have to remember is that there, there is a, yes, it's the Liberal Party of Canada and the Liberal Party of Ontario, but they're really kind of only distant cousins. Uh, there's not a lot of love between the two parties. Um, the resources, the people power, the money tends to go to whoever's in power. So right now that's provincially as opposed to federally. So um, I just had a crazy thought come into my head, which would be, wouldn't it be funny if Bob Ray ran for the job? in which case he would have been NDP Premier of Ontario, interim leader of the federal Liberals, and then maybe future leader of the Ontario Liberals. That would be a heck of a trifecta. But as far as I know, he's not considering that. Great. And um, here's a question from Liz, another good one. Do most voters really care about things like prorogation and contempt motions? It didn't work for the Ignatiev Liberals against Harper. It didn't bring out enough votes to change the federal government. I, you know, do most voters care about politics or public issues at all? I, I don't know. I, you know, 50% of them now only show up at the polls, so it may well be that um, it may well be that the public are uh, have, have a limited appetite for this kind of thing. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that most of members of the public are not into the intricacies of parliamentary democracy, but I don't think it's a terrible thing that we use these opportunities to kind of remind people that this is how our system works. We're not like the American system. Uh, our First Minister has an enormous amount of power, uh, more so than any governor or any pr uh, president does in the United States. And these are, in some respects, good civics 101 opportunities to really understand the differences in our system. We have responsible government up here. We have government by, uh, by the Premier, mostly, by the Prime Minister, mostly, occasionally by Cabinet, and uh, even more rarely by members of the backbench as well. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. It's um, pro Proroguing has been around for a long time, and it, it never hurts to remind ourselves how our system works. Great, Steve. Here's one uh, from Tom. How much does Steve think the new leadership will choose to distance itself from McGinty to solve issues around contracts, i.e. Bill 115, Power Plants, Orange? Is this part of their plan to distance themselves from McGinty moving forward? Well, I think the answer to that is, and this may not be all that satisfactory an answer, but the answer is it depends who wins. Uh, certainly, almost any time you have a leadership race, there will be a candidate or maybe more than one candidate who will want to distance themselves from whatever came before because that's a way to put a you know a really fresh coat of paint on the party and potentially take the party in a different direction. Remember, the problem for the liberals right now is that they've alienated so many different members of their base, it's hard to know where they go to get support to be competitive in the next provincial election. Uh, they have won three elections in part because they had excellent relationships with all the public sector unions and those unions have no time for them now at all. Now, I'm just blue skying here. If a Kathleen Wynne, a former education minister who had excellent relationships with teacher unions, uh, relatively speaking, if she were to win the leadership, could she come forward and say, you know what, um, what's done is done but we're going to veer off in a slightly different direction here and uh, I'm not going to take the approach that we took before. Could she do that and get away with it? Maybe, based on her track record. Uh, so, yes, all bets are off, but you got to remember that uh, while there's a lot of opposition out there to the Liberal Party right now, members of the Liberal Party like what they've done, in the main, over the last nine years. They think they've got a good story to tell on health care and education and the environment and social services. And, I, you know, if you want to get the votes of the Liberal Party faithful, who are, after all, the ones who are going to pick the next leader, um, you've got to watch how much you distance yourself from your record and your legacy. A lot of people like that record and like that legacy. Thank you, Steve. Um, in terms of a reminder of what, in terms of reminding the audi audience about what happens now in terms of uh, the prorogation of the House, I'd like you to explain that, and I've also got a couple of questions which, are, which touch on that same theme, so... Freddie asks, is it correct that nothing can be done now until the Liberal Party picks a new leader? So are we looking at February at the earliest? And Chris also asks, can the opposition parties reopen the legislature collectively by going to the LG to asking for withdrawal of support for pro prorogation of the legislature? Well, on that second question, the answer is easy and the answer is no. And I'm going to ask Tim Hudak and Andrea Horvath about that tonight. And I know what their positions are already. Uh, they looked into it and the answer is no. 
Uh, there is no constitutional relationship between the Queen's representative, uh, which is David Onley, the Lieutenant Governor, and the opposition leaders. There is none. Uh, David, Onley, uh, David Onley only has to take an, a meeting with the Premier of Ontario. He did that. The Premier and he are the only ones who can deal with the prorogation situation. So that's number one. Uh, previously to that, um, uh, the, the issue is about uh, whether anything goes on now that the House has been prorogued. Uh, the answer is yes and no. The no is that there's no question period. There are no committee hearings. There are no bills that will proceed through the legislature. So anything that requires first, second, third reading, royal assent to become law, none of that can happen. However, the government still exists. The cabinet still meets. Cabinet ministers still run their departments. Cabinet ministers can still change policy via regulation. Um, so to say that the government just shuts down is not true. However, a lot of the business of government will shut down. A lot of the business, as you pointed out, Naveen, earlier, all those 39 bills that Hillary Clark lists on our website, uh, all of those are dead in the water. So anybody who's out there, whose job depended on a lot of those bills coming forward and becoming law, your job is more precarious today. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Uh, however, it's not to suggest that nothing happens now. I mean, th the business of government does continue, uh, just not in, in the way that it did. Thank you, Steve. I've got you for exactly two more minutes, so cool. please time accordingly, as you say. Uh, here's another question from Mary. She's following up on her first question. If the new, le the new Liberal leader taking over from McGuinty chooses to go straight into election mode, what happens to the Ontario, to the 2013 budget? That's her question. Uh, well, there'd be no budget. Uh, if, if immediately after winning the leadership, the, the new leader decides to uh, go right to the lieutenant governor and uh, demand a, uh, an election, uh, which would be his or her right as the leader of the a new leader of the government and the new premier of Ontario, then that's what would happen, and the budget would have to be delayed, which is not unprecedented. That's, that could happen, and it wouldn't be the end of the world if the budget, I think the fiscal year in Ontario starts April 1st, so if you assume in a February or March leadership convention, um, you know, you wouldn't get a budget till May or June, and that wouldn't be the end of the world. Great, Steve. Uh, I know you have a show to do, and our last question is actually from uh, producer Meredith Martin. She asks, can you say proroguing Parliament ten times fast? Uh, the answer to that question is no. <laughs> but thank you for that question, Meredith. Meredith, I was really hoping I was going to get a better question out of you, maybe something about baseball or how beautifully Tony Bennett sang God Bless America the other night in San Francisco, but... Um, no, I can't say proroguing Parliament that quickly ten times. You got me. Thank you, Steve. Have a great show, and thanks for taking the time to join us before. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. See you on TV in nine minutes. Thanks, everybody, for all your questions. I'm sorry if we couldn't get to all of them. Like Steve said, we will be doing more of these, and what better way for you to spend the next hour than to watch the agenda. So we're going to be on air right at 8 o'clock. We're continuing our coverage of this story, and we're also going to be continuing our live chat. So this is going to become a text-only chat until 9 o'clock. If you're not going to be able to stay on your computer, and if you're going to be watching and you're going to be on Twitter, please chime in using Agenda TVO, the hashtag. Our producer, Allison Buckenterrell, is uh, monitoring our Twitter feed uh, for all of us. So let's continue to talk. And uh, I'm going to end the uh, video portion of the broadcast. And again, thank you for joining us, and we will do it again.